1997, Leonardo DiCaprio stood on the bow of the world's most elegant ocean liner, or a reasonable facsimile thereof, and shouted out the words which expressed the hopes and ambitions of the Titanic herself. He said, I'm the king of the world! Y'all remember that? Yeah. The, the, the irony is that this movie about one of the worst disasters, greatest disasters in all of history, <clears throat> became just that at the box office. Not a great disaster, but it became king of the world at the box office. In fact, from 1997 until 2009, 12 years, Titanic was the highest grossing movie of all time. And in fact, even today, it's actually the third highest grossing movie of all time. It was the king of the world, or at least the king of the box office. But how many of us, secretly, would like to be king of the world? You know, I suppose it's part of the human condition, part of fallen humanity. We all want to be king or queen in some sense. We want to be the boss. We want to be the head cheese, the, the, the head honcho, the, 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 the one in charge. We don't like being told what to do. We don't like being told how to do what they told us we're supposed to do. We want to be in charge of our own lives. And you know what? It starts at a fairly early age, doesn't it? About two years old or so, doesn't it? That's a terrible twos. And you know what? That's followed by the terrible threes and the terrible fours and the terrible forty fours and fifty fours and sixty fours. Suddenly, we want our way. We want things to go the way we want them to go. It's just part of life. We have trouble with texts in the Bible that mention words like submission. We don't like Hebrew, uh, Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And we really don't like verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Oh, no, we don't like that. We want to be boss. We want to be in charge. Romans 13.1, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. Yet the gospel call is a call to surrender. If you would open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. For the past few weeks, we've been asking the question, what will you do with Jesus? It's a personal thing. What will you do with Jesus? Will you listen to Him? Will you hear what He has to say about His plans for your life? Will you trust in Him? Will you believe that His way is the best way? Completely trusting in Him. Will you turn to Him, repenting of your sins and shortcomings? This morning I ask you, what will you do with Jesus? Will you surrender to Him? Romans 10, verses 9-11, through 11, Paul writes these words, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the Scripture says, anyone who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. What a tremendous promise that is. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, then we will be saved. And you go down a little further in verse 13, loudly and boldly proclaims, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What is Paul's point in all of this? You know, a lot of people read this and they conclude that all they have to do is confess that Jesus is Lord and they are saved. And from that point on, they can live their lives however they want to live their lives, do whatever they want to do, because they confess Jesus is Lord, then they'll be saved. 
But what does it really mean to confess Jesus is Lord? Two respected Bible dictionaries, Strong's and Thayer's, are in agreement with what that word confess means as it's used in Bible times. It means to acknowledge something fully, openly, and joyfully. To profess, to agree, to promise. What is it that we are professing openly, joyfully, when we confess Jesus is Lord? That Jesus is the Christ. That He is the Lord. That He is the Messiah. What we're saying is that Jesus is King. This morning I'd like for us to see what it means if we truly confess Jesus is Lord. Now if we're going to truly confess Jesus is Lord, there are at least three implications that are, that are going to happen that we cannot escape if we are going to surrender to Him and, make Jesus, and confess Jesus as Lord. And the first thing that it means is it means that we fully surrender to Him. Fully surrender to Him. We like to partially surrender to Him. That's pretty easy to do, actually. To partially surrender. To say, okay, God, you can have Sunday morning from 10.45 to 11.45 or a little longer if the preacher's long-winded, but we don't like that. But God, you can have that hour, but the rest of the week belongs to me. If we're going to say Jesus is Lord, it means that we fully surrender to Him. Think for a moment what a counterculture call that is. It goes against everything that our society tells us. Because see, our, everything in our culture tells us, have it your way, have it our way. I mean, we, you can get custom-built Anything. Custom-built homes. Custom-built cars. Custom-built suits if you have enough money. If you have enough money, you can have custom-built whatever. Anything you want, you can have custom-made for you. Even hamburgers at fast food places. Think about that. I mean, there was a burger chain, not, not in Siloam Springs, but elsewhere, that did an entire marketing campaign built around, have it your way. Because that's what we want in our society, in our culture. Everything in our culture tells us that we deserve to be happy. You deserve to be happy. In fact, the Constitution tells you you deserve to be happy. You have the right to be happy. Actually, you have the right to the pursuit of happiness. Okay? But you know what? <laughs> we need to do whatever it takes to make that happiness happen, no matter what. And if anyone dares to get in the way of our happiness, or our constitutional pursuit thereof, then they can be called all sorts of different names. And they can be told that they are all sorts of different things that are bad and ugly and whatnot. To fully surrender to Jesus goes completely against everything that the world tells us we need to do. To acknowledge Jesus as Lord is to say that I am not. Is to say that I am not Lord. I am not the, the, the King. And that's tough for some of us to do. It's tough for some of us to do because we want to be King of the world. And yet we have to admit and acknowledge that we're not even king of our own life. You see, there is a throne in our heart. All of us have a place within us, a seat of decision-making power. That place in our heart that guides us in the decisions that we make. That, uh, that, that uh, is sort of a driver's seat, a throne. So the question is, who is seated on that throne in your heart? Who is on the throne? Who is it that makes the decisions? Who is calling the shots? Is it you or is it Jesus? 
Bottom line, who have you surrendered to? In other words, who is your king? You know, some people have surrendered to things. Things are of utmost importance in their life. They have to have the latest thing before anybody else. They have to have the latest gadget. They have to have the latest technology before anybody else. As soon as it comes out, boom, they're right there and they want to get it. Some others have surrendered to job. Work comes before family. Work comes before friends. Work even comes before God. Some have surrendered to their hobby. Whatever it might be, they don't let anything interfere with that. If they are supposed to go and do something, no matter what happens, they're going to go and do it because that's what they like to do. That's their fun. That's their me time. And don't let anything interfere with it. But my friends, to make him king in your life means that he calls the shots. He's on the throne. Now, some think that that word Christ or Messiah is just another name for Jesus. That it's kind of, you know, we think Jesus Christ, that Jesus was his first name and Christ was his last name or something to that effect. But that's not the way that it actually works. If you, if you look back in the Greek and in the Hebrew, these words Christ and Messiah are roughly our equivalent of king. In Russia, the word is czar. In Latin, the word is Caesar. In uh, German, it's Kaiser. In English, it's king. We fully surrender to Christ or Messiah means king. Consider the two trials of Jesus. In Matthew, or Mark 14, verse 61, Jesus is brought before the high priest, and the high priest asks, Are you the Christ? That word, the Christ. Definite article, are you the Christ? Christ is not just another name for Jesus. Christ is a title. Christ means king. And in fact, in Matthew 27, verse 11, when Jesus is taken before Pilate, Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? So I ask you, is he your king? Just because he is truly king does not necessarily mean that you have acknowledged his kingship, that you've confessed him as such. As I've said the past three weeks, the gospel calls for us to make a decision. A personal decision. That's why we're asking, what will you do with Jesus? We have to make a decision. Part of our response is to fully surrender to Him. To place Him on the throne in our lives. But surrendering to Jesus, making him, confessing Jesus as Lord is more than just fully surrendering to him. It also means that we change our standards. We change our standards. That's more than just saying some words, okay? It involves words to, to be certain. But there's more to it than just speaking the words, you see, true confession is not just something that we do one time. There are some people who think that it is. It's kind of like if you confess that you're guilty of a crime, then you make that one confession and then, well, it kind of impacts the rest of your life, but you only have to do it one time. Folks, if we're going to confess Jesus as Lord, true confession isn't something that you do just once and then it's over with. It is something that is ongoing in your life. There are implications that follow your confession. We confess and then we keep on confessing. First we confess with our mouth, then we confess with our lives. You know, the first time we confess is a very important time in our lives. I remember the first time I confessed Jesus as Lord. When I was baptized, I remember my dad asked me an important question. 
He said, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? And I remember that I said, yes, I do. And I remember that then he, uh, he immersed me in water. And I think he was tempted maybe to keep me down there, but he brought me back up. And it was wonderful, and it was great. That's a confession. But that's not all there is to it. I'm afraid that we limit our understanding of true confession if that's all we think it is. Just something that I say before I get baptized. Making the quote-unquote good confession. You see, my friends, true confession is not just done once. True confession is about a lifestyle. Am I confessing that Jesus is Lord with my life? How do I know if I'm confessing that Jesus is Lord with my life? Well, some, what, what are some of the things that I choose to do with my free time? Do I spend all of my free time on me? Playing on my computer, my phone, my iPad or whatever pad that you have? Doing things that I like to do? Or do I sometimes use my free time to serve others? To help others? To do things that others will enjoy rather than just things that I will enjoy? What about the, am I confessing that Jesus is Lord with my life and the priorities that I set for myself and for my family? Am I trying to be king or is he king in my life? Am I confessing that Jesus is Lord of my life in the clothing choices that I make? Do I choose things that are appropriate to wear that, that reveal that I believe my body truly is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Or am I choosing things that society says, you know what, it's hot outside, so wear as little clothing as you possibly can. See, it's not just about style, it's about a lifestyle. We need to remember that. Am I confessing Jesus is Lord with my life? Am I confessing that Jesus is Lord with the way that I treat others? The way I love my spouse. Does that show that Jesus is Lord? The way that I treat my kids. The way that I love the church and, and show it by my involvement in it. The way that I treat my co-workers. The way that I treat my boss. The way that I treat my employees. The way that I treat my friends. The way that I treat my enemies. Does that show that Jesus is Lord? You see, when we make that good confession and we come up out of the waters of baptism, we've confessed that Jesus is Lord, but then it calls for a change in our standards. So how are you doing? Would others agree by seeing the way that you live that Jesus sits on the throne in your heart? If we were to ask your family... Would they tell us that Jesus is your Lord? If we were to ask your friends, would they tell us that Jesus is your Lord? If we were to go to your enemies and ask them, would they tell us that Jesus is your Lord? You see, we change our standards when we say, Jesus, you're going to be my Lord. You're going to be my King. We fully surrender to Him. We change our standards. And third, it means that we yield to His will. We yield to His will. What that means in plain English is that we do things His way. You want to go left? But Jesus says, get right. Which way do you go? Which way do you go when what you want conflicts with what Jesus wants? Which way do you go when you know you want to do something, but you know the Bible says you shouldn't be involved in that? Which way do you go? I'll give you a couple of uh, quick examples. You're really tired on Wednesday night. You've got so much to do. The Bible doesn't say nothing about coming together on Wednesday night. It does, however, give us an example of meeting daily. Okay? But no, you're right. It doesn't say anything about coming on Wednesday night. 
So what do you do? Do you stay at home and rest up for Thursday because it's another busy, busy day? Or do you attend Bible study? And I'm not talking about once or twice. I'm talking about habitually, okay? Or habitually, you know that you probably should come back on Sunday night. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing. I mean, we, we, you came on Sunday morning, so certainly you don't have to go twice. Actually, to be more scripturally correct, the, the church probably met on Sunday nights in the first century and not on Sunday morning. Because Sunday morning was, Sunday was a work day in the first century for the, for the Jews anyway as they were converting to Christianity. Saturday was the Sabbath. That's when they didn't do anything. Sunday nights. Your favorite team. Playing the late game. What are you going to do? You got to watch it. I mean, and if you watch the first part of it, it's hard to leave at halftime because you never know what's going to happen in the second half. And, yeah, and preacher, don't talk to me about DVRing it because by the time I get home and check social media, I'm going to know the outcome and then there's no fun in watching it on TV. And then we'll get to work tomorrow and, and everyone's going to be talking about it and I'm going to say, well, I went to church. I didn't watch the game. And people are going to laugh at me. Which are you going to choose? Or, you know, you really wish the Bible didn't say that about that sin. You really wish the Bible was silent about it, or, or the Bible said it was okay, or that, that you, know, you really wish that it didn't say that about that sin, but it does. So what do you do about it? The Bible says one thing, and you, in society, says something different. What do you do about it? For example, your marriage. Your marriage is on the ropes. Maybe your marriage is getting that standing eight count. And you know, it would be really easier, a whole lot easier, just throw in the towel. Give up. I mean, hey, you know, the world says, you know what, if you get married and you don't like it, get out of it. That's what the world says. But the Bible says that God invented marriage and intended it to be one man, one woman for their lifetime. The Bible says work a little harder at it. So what are you going to do? Or what about when you're standing around the water cooler on Monday and some coarse joking is going on? You know, people are talking about jokes and they're using all manner of four-letter words and they're taking God's name in vain and, and they're joking about things that really shouldn't be joked about in the first place. How are you going to respond to that? What are you going to do? Or there's a little bit of peer pressure going on. All your friends are talking about that new kid. And how weird they are, how strange they are, and laughing at them. Or they're talking about another person, spreading lies, gossip, etc. Or they're talking about that guy that was at the water cooler with you just a few minutes ago, but he said, you know what, I'm not going to listen to this type of joking and this type of conversation, and left. And now they're laughing at him for being, quote unquote, holier than thou. What will you do? You see, it seems to me that these questions get at the heart of what we're talking about. When life gives you a fork in the road, how do you decide which path you're going to take? At what point in that deliberating process do you consider, what does God want me to do? And then, do you do that? Or do you go ahead and do whatever it is that you want to do? Or that society tells you to do? Or you follow the crowd or, or your own desires? Make no mistake, there will come a day when all will confess Jesus as Lord. Romans 14, verses 11 and 12, Paul says, It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. My question is, do you want to wait until that day? 
Do you want to wait until the day of judgment to confess Jesus as Lord? Now what's going to happen if we put it off until then? Well, Jesus doesn't want us to wonder about that. So he tells us, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, he says, Whoever confesses me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Isn't it comforting to know that if we confess Jesus now, that he will confess us before his Father? Isn't it frightening to know that if we fail to confess Jesus now and therefore we disown him now, that he will disown us on that day? It's not easy. It's a challenge. It always has been. 1 Samuel chapter 8, the Israelites ask Samuel to appoint a king over them. Not so that they will have a dynasty that will lead them closer to God. They want a king so they can be like everybody else. Samuel doesn't want to do it. But God tells Samuel, you know what? It's not you they have rejected, but they've rejected me as their king. 1 Samuel 8 verse 7. Israel decided that they were going to put someone else on their throne. And it didn't work out too well for them, did it? So I ask you again, what will you do with Jesus? Will you listen to Him? Hear what He has to say about your life? Will you trust in Him? Believe that what He has to say is completely trustworthy and worthy of guiding your life. Will you turn to Him, repent of your shortcomings and sins, and will you surrender to Him? Confess that He is your Lord. That He is your King. That He is on the throne in your heart. If you've never confessed that Jesus is Lord, why not make today your day of surrender? Why not make today the day that you say to God, I want you on that throne in my heart? Because you see, oddly enough, the only way to victory is through surrender to Him. So take that step and commit your life to Him by being buried with Him in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. If that's your need, we want to help you meet that need. Maybe you made that commitment a long, long time ago. And as time has passed, you've experimented by placing other people, other things on the throne in your heart. Perhaps you even experimented with yourself being on that throne. And things maybe haven't worked out so well for you. It's time to put Jesus back where He belongs. It's time to once again surrender to Him. If we can help you to do that this morning through a public response in some way, we always like to give that opportunity. Maybe your response doesn't need to be public. Maybe it just needs to be private. Just between you and God. That's okay. And if that's your need, then I urge you to make that response. But if it involves something public, won't you let us know by coming to the front now as we stand and sing together?